we have Charlie Jane Anders here today to she's our MC for the day and she's just amazing here I, I just have Hello. lists of amazing things amazing things here about Charlie Jane her fiction and journalism have appeared and among other publications, the New York Times, Washington Post, Wired, Mother Jones, McSweeney's, Tin House, Asma Science Fiction, Lightspeed, Ziziva, that's just some of them. And just some of her awards are the Hugo, the Nebula, the Locust, the Lambda Literary, the Theodore Sturgeon. And my favorite is the Emperor Norton Award for Extraordinary Invention and Creativity Unhindered by the Constraints of Paltry Reason. I love that. Um, she has podcasts, amazing TED Talk. Um, she co-hosts and organizes a monthly trans nerd meetup. She came to the aid of local booksellers during the pandemic, hoping to set up online fundraisers. And we are forever grateful for that. And what I love about her most is that she's bursting at the seams of enthusiasm. And it's really great to have you here today, uh, Charlie Jane. So take it away. Yeah, well, thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. And I, I just, it's such a thrill to be here again with all of you. I just love hanging out with independent booksellers. Independent booksellers are like my favorite people. And, you know, and mentioned that last year we organized, I was a whole group of us that organized these fundraisers to help local bookstores in Northern California, in the Bay Area, particularly. And, you know, we were really worried about what was going to happen to bookstores during the pandemic. And it's just, it makes me just so happy to be here and to see all of you still here. And I've just been like, blown away and just in awe of the incredible resilience and creativity that bookstores have shown and the ability of booksellers to reinvent themselves and to just, you know, kind of find a new role for themselves in their communities. And, you know, I always say that, you know, bookstores are like petting zoos for stories where you can like go in and, you know, hold as many of them as you want and, and you know, and you can take some of them home with you and it's amazing. And they're like, you know, there's like a million portals that you could just like grab a portal and travel to an imaginary world or, or a real place. And it's, I love bookstores so much. And like last week, I finally was able to go back into the Booksmith, which is now in the old binary space and browse and browsing in a bookstore again just made me just happier than I can possibly say. It was like this physical sensation throughout my body of just like, I'm in my happy place again and I haven't been here for like over a year. And a whole, I missed this more than I could possibly have realized. So thanks all of you who have stuck this out and who are still here. And I just, I could talk for hours, but I'm so grateful and so just in awe of you all. But we should get started because we've got a lot of amazing authors to get through. And the first author that y'all are gonna be hearing from is one of my favorite people, somebody I've known for, I wanna say like 15 years. Uh, Rika Aoki uh, is a poet, uh, composer, teacher, and novelist whose books include Hemele Ahilo and two Lambda Award final finalists, Seasonal Velocities and Why Dust Shall Never Settle Upon This Soul. Rika's work has appeared or been recognized in publications including Vogue, Elle, Bustle, Autostraddle, Pop Sugar, and BuzzFeed. Her poetry was featured at the Smithsonian Asian Pacific American Center, and she was honored by the California State Senate for an extraordinary commitment to the visibility and to the visibility and well-being of transgender people. And I have read Light from Uncommon Stars. It is an incredible book. You are all going to love it so much. Take it away, Rika. Hey, thank you. Can everybody hear me okay? We good? Good. So anyway, thank you so much for having me at the showcase. I, I, I'm just happy. Um, in a way, I feel like I'm sending my child off to school because for the past five years or so, Light from Uncommon Stars has kind of been my everything. Now, I have a most gentle and sweet friend named Katrina. Uh, quite some years ago, she was, you might actually know Katrina, Charlie Jane. She was sad because whenever people said her name, whenever she said her name, people said, you mean like Katrina, like the hurricane? which might be a joke if not for the devastation. And, you know, she was hearing it every day. So I promised her I would write a book with a character named Katrina so someone could hear the name and not immediately think of the hurricane. Uh, so when it came, uh, came time to name one of my main characters and dedicate my book, it was already a done deal. Now, of course, that left the rest of the book. And for that, well... I was returning home from LAX one night and airports are draining and LAX even more so than most. And, but 
I was driving up La Cienega and suddenly there I saw it, Randy's Donut, this giant donut made of plaster and concrete and chicken wire and just shining in the night. And I thought to myself, I am home. And I was thinking everyone is an expert on donuts, right? And a lot of people think they know Southern California, but SoCal is such a donut place. Everything from the giant plaster donuts on the outside to the immigrants running the shops from within. You, you really can't understand Southern California without donuts. And I started thinking, well, what else did I wanna share? So when it came time to write a tale about space aliens and violinists and demons and donuts, I decided it would not be your ordinary everyday tale of space aliens, violinists, demons, and donuts. In Light from Uncommon Stars, I took my space opera fantasy mashup of Amadeus meets Galaxy Quest and sent it in the San Gabriel Valley with miso soup and kiwi boba, Menudo on the weekends and evenings with Chinese barbecue duck. See, I saw so many depictions of greater Los Angeles, uh, so, many, so many renderings that just ignored this place that I knew so well. I mean, it's my hometown, it's a place I really love. So to be honest, a lot of my research for the book was just revisiting the neighborhood. I was having boba, barbecue duck, some donuts, checking out some pho, more donuts. And then there was the fantasy part and the science fiction. And to be honest, most of my recent pu publications have been in small press literary kind of things. But at my heart, I am quite the D&D &D science fiction nerd. I mean, I cut my teeth on Star Trek and Space 1999 first season, and books by Doc Smith and R.A. Lafferty. So, you know, if I was going to mention Stargates and Warp Drive, I was sure as heck going to do it right. So I revisited my Star Trek, reread my space operas, and because it helps to be up on these things, I binge watch SciShow Space and PBS Space Time on YouTube. And music. I love the violin. This book's got lots of violin in it, but I knew next to nothing about it. So I haunted my local violin shops and pestered luthiers. I even bought an instrument off of eBay and taught myself to play, to just, just to smell the rosin and get annoyed with the peg slipping, you know, things you can't learn secondhand. I mean, for example, when you play the violin, you're a lot closer to the sound. I mean, you think about a piano, I'm a pianist, pianos are more massive and larger, but you never think about a pianist going deaf from their own instrument. But the violin is so much closer to your ears. It's like close to you. So you respect it in a different way. Like when you tune the high E string, it's actually kind of frightening. You're approaching perfect pitch and the string's getting tighter and tighter. But if it snaps, it's gonna make this horrible sounding because you don't even wanna be there. So unlike the piano, it's kind of more like your own body and your voice. It can fail and even hurt you. And so, and so, you know, my characters. In Light from Uncommon Stars, I wanted to write about people like me, some of whom life might not have treated too well. My characters may need to be heroes, but they're also women and queer and people of color. They're violinists who've done horrible things. They're mothers trying to preserve the family business. They're refugees fleeing a war from beyond the stars. Now, some things I felt particularly qualified to write. I mean, there's no better way to feel damned or cursed or an alien on your own planet than being a transgender woman of color. But even in writing some of the painful passages, I became even more and more sure that this was a story that I wanted to share with all of you. In Light from Uncommon Stars, I made the space aliens Asian refugees, the violinists transgender runaways, for abuse survivors and immigrants and queer, runa and queer runaways. They still possess their birthright to dream. And with Light from Uncommon Stars, I wanted to mix the personal with the miraculous and fantastical to show that queer and transgender people are miraculous and fantastical. That even as we're jumping on a bus or a starship or fleeing damnation itself, beyond our tears, we will sing and we will laugh and we will have donuts.
And sometimes there will even be laughter and donuts to share. In Light from Uncommon Stars, I hope to share some of our world, one in which the music of so many queer and transgender voices, whether still here or taken from us, is always, always heard. You see, I believe that art and music and literature are our most powerful humanizing forces. If a trans musician can make an audience cry by playing bar talk, how else but as a human can she be regarded? And if a book written by a queer trans Asian American can make you think of your hometown, your families, remind you of your favorite music and donuts and make you dream again to visit your most uncommon stars, then what more powerful statement of our common humanity can I make? So thank you for letting me chat about Light from Uncommon Stars. It's from me to you with much love, much admiration and boundless respect for all you do from me and all of us here at TOR. Thank you. Wow. Please give it up for Rika Aoki. I, I, you know, if you could like snap your fingers or, you know, yeah, say something in the chat. And somebody just mentioned, but if you have questions, we would love to ask, answer your questions. There's a little Q&A thought balloon, word balloon thing at the bottom. Please do put your questions in. Next up, we have one of my favorite authors, somebody who's inspired me so much. Becky Chambers is known for her Hugo award-winning Wayfarer series, which I don't know where I'd be if it wasn't for those books. Becky has a background in performing arts and grew up in a family heavily involved in space science. She spends her time, free time playing video and tabletop gaming games, keeping bees, and looking through her telescope. Scope, te telescope. Having hopped around the world a bit, she's now back in her home state where she lives with his, her wife in northern, no, northern California. Becky Chambers hopes to see Earth from orbit one day. Please give it up for Becky Chambers. Yeah, thank you so much, Charlie Jane. I'm so excited to be here. And uh, I'm also like really choked up from the previous pitch. So we'll see how I do. Um, but hello, everyone. I'm here to talk about A Psalm for the Wild Built, my new book. Um, it is very different than my other stuff, largely because there are no spaceships in it. So uh, this is a solar punk science fantasy set in a secondary world. So allow me to whisk you away to the moon of Panga, which is where people live and always have because I say so. So a little bit of backstory for you. Um, Panga was facing a crisis that will sound familiar to everyone, I'm sure. Uh, they were facing ecological collapse due to rampantly unsustainable extractive means of production. Um, highly fictional, I know. Uh, and all of their factories are staffed, for lack of a better word, by robots. Um, they do all of the, the menial labor that no one else wants to do. One day, for reasons that still no one knows why, all of the robots wake up. They gain consciousness and sentience en masse and uh, stop working as one would. Humanity, to its credit, immediately puts on the brakes and says, uh, well, you know, <laughs> hey, whoa, we didn't mean to create life here. So let's, let's sort this out. And they make the robots an offer. They say, you are welcome to join us here in human society. Um, you will be free and equal citizens. We can rebuild the world together. You know, we, we would love to have you here. And the robots think seriously about this and they politely decline. All the robots know is factory life and urban cities and the, the trappings of human civilization. They do not know a world that is untouched by people. And that is all they want to see is what the world looks like without us. So collectively they leave, they wander off into the wilderness to observe nature in its raw and untouched state and have not been heard from since. Um, at this point, robots are something of an urban legend. Uh, they are obviously part of penguin history. Everybody knows that they're real, but to say that you've seen a robot is kind of like saying you've seen Bigfoot. Um, people are, are disinclined to believe it. So we now fast forward to the here and now. Penga has become a thriving, healthy, and I hesitate to say utopian because everywhere has its problems, but it's pretty, Good. It is a high-tech society um, in which 
everything just kind of clicks along. It's working in concert with nature as opposed to in opposition to it. Uh, you can picture urban forests and living roofs and solar panels and just everything is alive and touchable and healthy and good. Uh, and within this, we meet our protagonist, Sibling Dex. Sibling Dex is a monk, a disciple of the god of small comforts. And specifically, uh, Dex is a tea monk. And what a tea monk is, is this very old tradition in which uh, there is a, a ritualized service in which you can go to a tea monk anytime you need a break. It doesn't have to be uh, any big disaster or trauma in your life. It could just be kind of an off day. You go see a tea monk, you sit down with them and you let them know what's up. Here are your problems. Here's what's on your mind. Here is, you know, what your headspace is that day. And the monk will then make you a cup of tea just for you based on your mood and your needs and where you're at. This is what Dex's profession is. They've worked very, very hard uh, to be able to do this and they care a lot about their work. They have uh, a little wagon and an electric bike and they travel from village to village making tea for other people's problems. However, Sibling Dex has grown dissatisfied with their life for reasons they cannot put their finger on, and this satisfaction grows and grows until they do what one does in such a situation. Uh, they wander off to the woods to sort themselves out, and in doing so, they meet a robot. Uh, the robot's name is Mosscap, and Mosscap has been sent by its robot cohorts um, to contact humanity for the first time since they all left. They're very curious as to how people have gotten on without them. Obviously the world has gotten a lot healthier. They know that things have changed, but they don't exactly know how or why. And so Moscap has been sent to talk to people and ask a very particular question, which is what do people still need? So Dex and Moscap form a friendship. They go on a cool, philosophical road trip together trying to answer this unanswerable question. Uh, as with all of my stuff, I will be the first person to tell you that my stuff is anchored way more in character than in plot. If you are looking for a big crunchy plot, do not come here. Um, this is intentionally a cozy, comfortable, low stakes read. Um, this is by far the chillest thing I've ever written. <laughs> I say that as someone who has written a lot of chill things. This is super chill. I recommend it to anyone who needs a break. It is intended to, to fit the same niche as that cup of tea that Dex makes for everybody. Um, it is a book that I hope will give you a lot to think about and a lot to chew on, but it is also meant to be effortless. It is meant to be comfortable. It is meant to be something you can just cozy up with in the evenings. Um, I love these two so much. I'm really excited to have this uh, about to, to go out into the world and I really hope you'll check it out. So thank you so much for, for listening. Thank you all for being here. Uh, Monk and Robot, the end. Wonderful. Right. Yay, please show some love to Becky Chambers in the chat or snap your fingers or do little emojis or whatever you want to do. Uh, next up, we've got the amazing Brahm, and uh, over the past few decades, acclaimed dark fantasy art artist Brahm has lent his distinctive vision to all facets of the creative in industries, from novels and games to comics and films. He is the author of The Child Thief, Krampus, The Lost Gods, and the award-winning illustrated horror novels The Plucker and The Devil's Rose. Brahm is currently kept in a dank cellar just outside of Seattle. Please give some love to Brahm. Hello, hi, good to be here. Um, first of all, thank you so much for allowing me this opportunity to talk to everybody. Uh, I feel like I've been a, in a cave for the last couple of years, uh, first working on this book and then of course COVID. So um, um, I get a little nervous of being in front of everybody and we had just two such wonderful articulate uh, authors before me. So I will do my best to, to convey what's behind my story here. Um, I think the best place for me to start is, is the inspiration for my books, because um, that spark is, is something I'm you know, trying to express in my book. And the excitement that I felt that, that inspired the book is, is something I hope will also inspire people to read it. Um, in my case, uh, I've always had a fascination with, um, with the, the 
with horror from the monster's perspective. To me, the monsters and creatures are always far more fascinating than, and interesting than the human characters in there. It's like, what makes them tick? You know, the, we think they're evil, but most cases, monsters aren't evil from their point of view. You know, humans are either food or we're in their way or we've destroyed their habitat and so on and so forth. So most of my stories have revolved around um, the monster's perspective or have largely been about them. Um, in this case, my, my new novel, Slewfoot, um, is focused on witches. Uh, and, you know, there's so much wonderful literature out there on witches. You know, how do I make this different? How do I make this unique? And um, for me, this, this whole spark started when I was watching a, an in-depth documentary on the Salem witch trials, followed shortly by the, the movie The Crucible, the Daniel Day-Lewis version. And the whole time I was watching that, I was just going, ah, oh, it'd be so great if, if one of these women on trial is actually a witch, if she actually had some, some, some pagan spirit behind her, if she could just turn this whole trial upside down on its head. Um, and so I'm like, I, I can make that happen. I need to make that happen. And uh, I really wanted it, I love in my novels to be as realistic and historically a true as possible to me to make that setting as real as possible and then introduce the supernatural element. Um, it gives it uh, such a layer of depth in, in, in reality and in, in, in immersion. So I started digging deep into all the research, um, especially in colonial America, with the witch trials and so forth. And one of the things that I found out right away, um, it was interesting how often that witches were widows. And I was like, why is that? And Puritan society, um, uh, you know, it's very patriarchal. The, the men pretty much owned all the property and had all the say in any political uh, um, discussion or decision making. And the women, you know, their role was much more as a homemaker and they were uh, to, to a large degree subservient to, to the, the, their husbands. Um, they didn't own property and they weren't allowed to speak on these issues. But there's one exception to that and that's if their husbands died, if they became widows. Um, it was part of the religious charter that at that point, they were obligated to God to fulfill their husband's will. Um, and this gave them, you know, equal footing. So in reality, you know, this isn't not even, of course, it sounds like fiction, but in reality, what this led to is when people had disputes over property or somebody wanted their property or any sort of problem, it was easy to just call them a witch. And as soon as they were called a witch or accused of witchcraft, they would lose, you know, their freedom and their property and so forth. Uh, so that that element there played a huge role in this. So my book Slewfoot um, starts starts off with a young uh, English, very scared English lady named Abatha, and she is in England, and she is basically shipped off to the colonies during that period. Uh, there was a shortage of brides. So the king sent a, for, for a, a small bounty, sent a, a, a lot of women over there. Uh, their fathers would sell them into, into to marriage. So she was sold off and sent into this very rigid Puritan society. Um, and so she was having a very difficult time fitting in, but she at least gets along well with her husband. They have a special relationship. Um, without giving too much away, very early on in the book, her husband dies. Um, and suddenly this woman who's basically an outsider that's not fitting in very well, suddenly it has equal footing. And this does not go over very well with her brother, with her husband's brother who has his eye on her farm. And he begins shenanigans to, to basically um, take over that farm, to put her in a position where she will lose the farm. Um, enter into this story a, a just, what I would love to see in, uh, is, is a dark spirit within the woods there. Not necessarily dark, but, but there's a, there's a, there is a, a wild spirit in her woods that has been disturbed and has come to. And he, this spirit is not sure who or what it is. And it is trying to figure that out. And he approaches Abatha and they begin a relationship. And this book follows their relationship as, as, as this creature tries to discover exactly what it is and what its role is. And as she too is torn between her religious background and, and the help that this creature offers her. So she has to make a decision to, to, to follow, you know, to, to follow this creature and what it offers her. You know, is it a devil or is it a savior? Um, and to wrap it all up where this, this story goes is I 
do end up with, with my witch trial where we have a, a witch on trial that is indeed a witch who indeed has a powerful uh, pagan spirit behind her and in uh, and, and all chaos ensues after that. So, so that pretty much wraps up Sufa and, and what I'm trying to do with it. Thank you. Yay, please show some love to Brahm. That was so exciting. I, I love witch trials. I love witches. I love, I'm just super excited by everything. That and if I could add one about. other thing, uh, yeah. as an illustrator, one of the big joys is I, I do fully illustrate the book. So there's, uh, you know, all the key characters and monsters are all fully painted within the novel. Uh, that's amazing. I love your artwork so much. Thank you. Um, so I guess I'm next and uh, I already got introduced and already introduced me at the start, so I don't have to introduce myself, thank goodness. Uh, I already think I told you all about my young adult book that came out a, a month ago, Victory is Greater Than Death. I was just talking to someone who thought the title was Victory is Greater Than Death, like T-H-E-N, and I was like, so you get greater victories and then you die. That's like, that's that book. So, but it's not. Anyway, so I'm really grateful to all of you who've supported Victory is Greater Than Death, and I'm just like, it's been such a fun ride so far. Um, but I'm here now to talk to you about a book that comes out in August called Never Say You Can't Survive. And this book's a little bit different. It's not a novel. It is a nonfiction book about creative writing. And, you know, basically it's about how you can use creative writing to get through hard, scary times. And I was writing Never Say You Can't Survive throughout 2020. And, you know, I posted a chapter online almost every week at Tor.com, and I had pitched this idea for a book about how to use creative writing to get through hard times at the start of 2020, because I could tell that last year was going to be tough. Even in January, I could tell it was going to be a tough year, but honestly, nothing could have prepared me for how incredibly, you know, awful 2020 actually was for so many of us and how much that year was going to take away from everybody that I loved. And, you know, I was posting these essays every week online about how to create your imaginary world or, or do creative nonfiction and how this could help you to cope with a scary, scary political situation and kind of an apocalyptic scenario. And I, I wanted to do this to provide some comfort to all my writer friends out there and all my friends who might want to be writers. But I ended up really comforting myself a lot by writing those essays. Like having that project to do and having a place where I could remind myself that writing is a healing practice, it ended up meaning a lot to me. Um, and you know, uh, last year I lost my father about a year ago. I lost some other people that I cared about and a close family member had a really scary, scary health crisis that felt really kind of apocalyptic for a while there. And you know, I was fighting sol solace and working on my young adult trilogy and my as yet unannounced adult novel, but also in just the act of geeking out about writing and just like getting kind of technical, but also getting kind of inspirational about the writing process. And, you know, to back up slightly, I used to do a lot of writing advice on io9, which was this website that I used to help to edit back uh, during the Obama administration. And, um, you know, I, I found that I loved spouting off about how to create characters and how to find the right plots and how to build a world that readers might want to put down roots in. And I discovered that like, you know, kind of just talking about writing and like having these like intense crunchy conversations about writing with other people, you know, made me love writing more. And that it, it was like discovering a whole new aspect of something that already meant everything to me. And then, you know, I left io9 in 2016 and I was really thinking about trying to sell a book of my writing advice and trying to like, you know, do a writing advice book, but that's kind of a crowded market. There's a lot of writing advice books out there already. And, you know, Stephen King already wrote a writing advice book and so did a lot of other people who I admire. And so I wanted to find my own kind of angle and my own kind of sense of what a writing advice column could be or writing advice book could be. And, uh, you know, and then Never Say You Can't Survive was actually started out as a talk that I gave at a writing conference in like 2017 or 2018. And, you know, everybody I knew was kind of freaked out. We were all kind of scared. It was kind of an intense time. And I, you know, got up in front of this crowd of like writers and, and beginning writers and was like, this is important. This is a thing that you can do that will make you feel better and safer when things are actually not safe. 
And, but it's also a thing that you can give to the world and a thing that you can help other people feel safer and feel like they have the power to make a change and to do something in the world. And the more I did this and gave this talk at different conferences and you know events, the more I felt like this was something that I really wanted to kind of expand on. And you know, I wanna emphasize that never say you can't survive. I obviously write a lot of science fiction. It's published by Tor.com, but this is a book that's about creative fiction and a little bit creative nonfiction. It's not just for science fiction writers. It's for anybody who wants to make up stories and invent their own worlds, whether it's, you know, a world based in the real world or another planet in the future. And I really feel like part of what I want to get at in the book is that you can learn more about yourself by creative writing. You can kind of see how your own brain works by seeing how stories come out of you. And you know, if writing is your house, there's always more rooms to explore. You can also kind of make imaginary friends and get lost in worlds of your own creation. And, you know, I want to just wrap, wrap up by saying that creative writing kind of got me through a weird childhood. I had a learning disability in elementary school, and I had this uh, special education teacher who basically helped me to learn how to do schoolwork and part of how she did that was by getting me to write my own stories and write a play. We performed it and kind of make up my own, just she used my natural tendency to kind of get lost in my own imagination to kind of make me get better at schoolwork. And I, I want everybody to know that, you know, this power to create worlds and to find yourself in them is open to everybody. And that if you write, you are a real writer. And Writing is also how I got through transitioning and coming out and figuring out my own identity. And, you know, storytelling is how we put our neurotic, weird human consciousness on top of a universe that makes no sense and is kind of chaotic and bizarre. And, you know, you can use all of the devices of narrative to rewrite the fabric of reality and make your own rules for existence, which is pretty freaking cool. And, you know, the thing I say at the end of a, the, the introduction of the book, which I always said to those writing conferences to kind of inspire people is you have the power to create worlds and the monsters are scared of you. So that's that. Uh, next up, we have the incredible uh, Katriona Ward, who was born in Washington, DC and grew up in the United States, Kenya, Madagascar, Yemen, and Morocco. She studied English at Oxford and later the creative writing masters at the University of East Anglia. Her second novel, Little Eve, won the 2019 Shirley Jackson Award and the August Derleth Prize at the British Fantasy Awards. Her debut, The Girl from Raw Blood, also won the 2016 August Derleth Prize, making her the first and only woman to win the prize twice. Her, second, her short stories have appeared in numerous anthologies. She divides her time between London and the remote English moors. Please give it up for Katriona Ward. Ah, okay, hi. Um, yes, so thank you so much for that, Charlie. God, you all so articulate and wonderful. It's 2.30 in the morning for me here, so you're gonna have to bear with me a little bit. Um, so uh, this is the last house on Needle Street, which uh, is it's it's probably my 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 darkest and ma and maddest book, um, which I always think is is a is a um, an encouraging an encouraging thing to say about a book, but um so uh, briefly it's about uh, a lonely man called Ted who lives at the end of uh, Needle Street, and Needle St in, uh, in the last house on Needle Street, and Needle Street itself ends in this sort of great roiling Pacific Northwest growth uh, that that runs all over Washington State. Um, and he lives with his teenage daughter, Lauren, and his very disapproving religious Bible reading gay cat, Olivia, uh, who narrates part of the story. Um, and uh, so children have been going missing in this area in, in, for some time, for some years, disappearances that have never been explained. Um, and a young woman who called Dee, who believes that Ted might have something to do with, with her, her own sister's disappearance. Um, some years ago, moves into the, the vacant house next door and if, essentially starts surveillance on him to try and establish whether he might have anything to do with her sister Lulu's disappearance. And then Ted's own daughter goes missing and uh, events escalate from there. I think <clears throat> it's difficult, it, it, but the problem with this book is always talking, I, I always feel I have to talk around it as opposed to talking 
uh, directly at, it's, it's a bit like Schrodinger's book. I can't look directly at it because it, you, um, I, think it, I think it would be a great shame to take away the, um, the, 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 the reveals that, that, that the book holds. But what I will say is that this book tested me more than any other book has, has done, like uh, technically and emotionally. Um, and it does deal with some very difficult subjects. Um, there's one event in particular that reverberates through it. Um, it's not based on it, but it does, it's somehow, it's in the text throughout, which is the Lake Sammamish murders, whereby, where, which happened in 1974 when Ted Bundy took two, not one, but two girls in succession over the course of hours from a crowded lakeshore on a Memorial Day weekend. Um, and he walked up to them and he introduced himself by his name. He said, I'm, you know, I'm Ted. He had his arm in a cast and asked them to help, help them, help, asked them to help him move something. So, and they were found um, some months later on a neighboring hillside. Uh, and this event seems to me the height of egregious uh, greed. It has this cold grip on my heart, you know, uh, the, the, the sheer impunity of it, um, the sheer, greedy callousness of it um to you know in the space of in the space of two hours to to approach and 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 stalk and take two 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 young women uh, janice ott and denise nasland were their names um and it it has it has this sort of quality that i, I that quality the quality a quality of unreal gothicness that it shouldn't it shouldn't intrude into real life but it but it did there was um, a, a comment by the, uh, the FBI investigator who, who, who uh, dealt with the crime scenes whereby they had to take some of the, the, the artifacts from the birds' nests because the birds have been making nests with artifacts from, like hair from the, from the crime scene. And it's one of those, one of those things again that, where the monstrous seems to have impinged on reality. Monstrous seems to have crept out of the depths of our imaginations and, and impinged on reality. Um, I think this is a moment when I, I'd like to talk a little bit about horror. Like I think Charlie, you said you said earlier that um, writing got you through a lonely childhood. I would say horror got me through a lonely childhood because I think one thing that horror doesn't get enough credit for is its huge capacity for empathy and recuperation. Essentially, what you're doing as a writer is you're holding out your hand to the reader through the page and saying, "I'm afraid of this." If you're afraid of it too, then take my hand and we'll walk through it together. Um, and I, I believe it has it it does have this immense capacity to to to, to enlarge our experience and our, and our empathy by sharing these these terrible things that that that, that shouldn't really exist. Um, I I hope also it's a book very much um, although it does have it does have difficult very difficult content. I would hope that it is a book that's as much about survival and hope and about people finding that hope in places where none should exist, um, where you shouldn't be able to, uh, you shouldn't be able to, to, to not, not only survive, but, but sometimes thrive in almost impossible circumstances. And that's what, that's what I wanted to, to, to talk about with this book. It's, um, yes, it's, uh, it's, it, it's, it's very much, uh, there's, uh, there's an image of a, a Russian doll in it, which I think is very much a model for what the actual structure of the book is. Um, but it's also, there's the, 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 the character of uh, Olivia the cat, who narrates a large part of the book, and I pretty much, you pretty much know who's going to enjoy it and who isn't, about, by who stops reading at those chapters. Um, if like, I cannot read a book written, written by a Bible, a Bible bashing gay cat, then th this book is not for them. Um, and there's a, a little quote from what Ted, um, the narrated, one of the narrators, Ted, says. He says, I judge people two ways, on how they treat animals and on what they like to eat. If their favorite food is some kind of salad, they are definitely a bad person. Anything with cheese, they are probably okay. Which I think is just a good rule for life, really. Um, um, so this, you know, this, this is, this is a book which is sort of, the, I sort of see it as like the culmination of all of my, all of my thoughts and the, and the goth, and the gothicness that has always really been very important to my writing. There's, um, I think there, there's, there's something said about the gothic, which I think is equally true about horror and you can transpose it, which is that it's got, 
it's less it's sometimes less of a genre in itself than a virus that adapts and morphs and attaches itself to other genres as it as it as it goes through time which i think is an excellent way of looking at it because when we when we ask ourselves what horror is or what gothic is it's very it's almost very difficult to tell um i think that it's it's um it it does have that very adaptive incredibly like versatile generously shaped ability to tell stories which cannot be told any other way that are from the depths. Um, and the research I did for this book, I have to say was, uh, blew my mind. I talked a lot to people who suffer from the conditions that are discussed in this book. And I felt I came away with a completely different understanding of how the world and the mind were constructed. Um, the entire world seemed different to me. It seemed impossible that that the world should contain these, these, uh, these um, incredible coping strategies, but also, perfectly logical it seemed like the only possible way that the mind should could act um and it you know i i it enlarged it, it cost me but this book enlarged me i would say as much as it did cost me as as i was writing it um and yeah i i i'm very <laughs> I'm still i i'm very proud of the talking cat and um i think uh you know she uh she i think she carries the book and she performs a function in the book i think which uh, for the reader that she performs for Ted, which is she provides comfort for him and to him as she as she does to the reader. She's our she's kind of our moral center and our moral guide through through a very some quite dark labyrinthine passages. Um, and yeah, I think I I I I hope people enjoy it. <laughs> Yay! Please share some love for Catriona Ward. Oh my God. Hey, that was so exciting. I love cat narrators. I just love cats and books in general. Oh my God, that's so awesome. And, you know, finally and definitely not least, we have Bethany C. Morrow, whose book, uh, A Song Below Water, just completely rocked me. I love it so much. I keep thinking about it. Bethany C. Morrow is a recovering expat recently returning from six years in Montreal to live and write in North Country, New York. A California native, Bethany graduated from the University of California, Santa Cruz with a BA in sociology. Following undergrad, she studied clinical psychological research at the University of ba Wales, Bangor in Great Britain before returning to North America to focus on her literary work. She is the author of the adult novel, Mem, from Unnamed Press, and the editor of the young adult anthology, Take the Mic. Please give it up for Bethany C. Morrow. Hello. It is always interesting to find out which of my bios will be on display. So you got the nerdy school one for some reason. I'm so sorry, everyone. Um, so I am actually here today to talk to you about a Chorus Rises, which is the follow-up to A Song Below Water. And briefly, I kind of have to talk about A Song Below Water, which also comes out in paperback on June 1st, uh, the same day that um, A Chorus Rises releases, because the inspiration is kind of, you won't understand the inspiration for the second without the inspiration for the first. So um, A Song Below Water is about two teen girls, black girls growing up in an alternate Portland, Oregon, where magical people exist, magical beings exist. And among them are sirens, which now are only and exclusively black women, which of course means that the power of sirens is absolutely unacceptable and is feared and has to be repressed. And one of our teenage girls knows from the beginning of the story that she herself is a siren. And the, uh, there's something called the network that tries to hide that information uh, within the black community. The network uh, knows who the sirens are and, and tries to keep them from, from detection. And um, the reason that I wrote that story is because I was on Twitter with my sister and a black woman was being doxxed and, and abused and would eventually have to leave the space um, because obviously her life was in danger. And the whole point of that, the reason for that, of course, was because she said something. Um, <laughs> so I said, my voice is power to my sister and realized that that was 
a statement from the book um, and that it, it it was a world in which we, it, it's not a world in which the, uh, the child is unaware that they're the chosen one. This isn't the trope where someone has to come and tell you that you have power. It's very close, it's contemporary fantasy, it's very close to the real world, wherein Black women know we have power, we know our voices are powerful, we simply know that power is disallowed and disliked and therefore under attack. And so you can imagine why I had to write A Chorus Rises after A Song of the Water begins to come out. You have two girls, both of whom have dealt with trauma that's pretty much very upfront and on the page. It's definitely not a, a story about Black pain, but Black pain, unfortunately, is a part of the Black American existence. And so they experience different things and the relationship is really beautiful and everybody loves Tavia and Effie, but there's one other Black girl in the story and her name is Naima. And what immediately started to happen was people felt very, and I'm talking about in the real world, people immediately felt very comfortable declaring their hatred for this other 16 year old girl who was also a child, who was also a black girl. And so this is the first book that I wrote because I was like, no, here's what we're not gonna do. Um, this is, that's, that's not how this is going down. I didn't give you a sacrificial black girl to hate. Um, I'm, I'm really trying to interrogate the fact that we can only hold space for a couple for the ex exceptional and the model minority. And Naima, my beloved Naima is a black girl who loved herself from the start. She did not wait to have permission to think she was amazing because she already knew. And because of that, she is easy, she is easy for our world to dislike. The interesting part is that she's also a loco, which in this world means that she has, uh, she's the top of the food chain in terms of magical beings. If sirens were at the bottom, a loco are definitely at the top. And so her entire experience has been celebrity basically um, within Portland. But some things transpire at the end of a song below water that, questionably like what her involvement really was, which is kind of the, the book, of course, Rises starts a year later. And it's dealing with the fact that yes, Naima was not a perfect person. She absolutely was not the antagonist, but she definitely wasn't the perfect, she was not the perfect girl. She did not get along with these girls. And there's a question about whether she is responsible for Tavia's siren identity being revealed. And You'll have to read the book to figure out, of course, what she thinks about all of that. But the what, what happens is that Tavia, the siren from the first book, is elevated to a level of celebrity. And because the world cannot handle two Black women having being loved at the same time, uh, Naima experiences this immediate drop in popularity, this immediate turning on her um, of the society that has previously treated her wonderfully, she thought, because she's a loco. But it turns out that the intersectionality of being, yes, a loco, but also a Black girl, where we have to decide how many Black girls we like, suddenly the privilege and the power of that um, is stripped from you in a way that she was not aware could be stripped from her. She, did, she was not aware that her identity was up for discussion and up for debate and dependent on the, the feelings of other people. So I always say I'm, my work across all genres and across all categories is, also, is always to indict the American imagination. And Naima is like the first real time discourse uh, response where it was like, no, you're not going to attack this girl. You're not going to talk about this girl like she was the villain of a book that the, because just briefly, spoiler alert, for a Song Below Water, the, um, the antagonist is white supremacy. So you're not gonna pin that on a 16 year old black girl, right? Um, so this, this book was my real time um, progression of this discourse and elevation and complication of diversity. Because as I always say, diversity is a really, is an ugly word to me because it pretty much means we're gonna keep the power majority in place and then we're gonna garnish everybody else sort of around them. So we're not gonna necessarily challenge the ideas and the structures and the apparatus that we have in place that, that create this very over-representation, lopsided sort of uh, storytelling. We're simply gonna start sprinkling people around. Um, 
a chorus rises is my rejection of that. A chorus rises is this is the problem with diversity versus inclusion. Um, inclusion means whiteness doesn't have to be censured in the story whatsoever. Um, I, I can I can start and end, begin and end talking about this this girl and what her experience has been and who she believes herself to be and the way that she will not be your perfect victim and she will not bleed on the page to make you feel better and to make you feel like she's been redeemed. Um, and she's aggressively not willing to do that. So I said, our, um, if we're really getting where we think we're going in society, then it should be okay to be an angry black girl. So this is, here's your, here's your angry black girl who also has, is hilarious and I love her and has a lot of fun with her family and, and uh, with her cousin, especially Courtney. And I really wanted to also talk about the fact that when you met Naima in A Song Below Water, you were meeting someone in someone else's story and came to, you know, and so when we come to really strong opinions about who someone is based on the fact that they appeared in someone else's story, it's time to give them their own story. It's time to see who this person is and how they feel about themselves when they are the protagonist and the story revolves around them. Um, and I think that that sort of that complication, I, I will say that I expect for people to either really get this book or not get it because it is pushing the narrative uh, and, and it's, it's pushing the representation further than we've, we've really been in first year, I feel, for at least 15 years in terms of our in terms of our discussion on inclusion and stuff. So this is saying I I I'm not going to ask forgiveness. I'm not going to I'm not going to say that I was a horrible person because you want me to. I'm not going to say that I don't love myself because it'll make you feel better. Um, so I I really think that it's a book that's pushing us toward authentic representation in which we can be complicated, in which we can be flawed, in which we can be lovely and loved and also not liked by some people. And that does not make us monsters. It just means we don't, everybody doesn't get along. Um, and it, it, there's, there's not necessarily a villain involved in that. So I am extremely in love with this book. I'm extremely in love with Naima. Um, I don't think it would surprise anybody to say that she is actually probably the easiest person for me to write um, as a person who came out like this. Like I was this person since I was six years old, unfortunately for my teachers and family members. Um, but so I wanted to, I wanted to write not a redemption arc, but a centering of someone that had already, whose, whose story had already been decided, whose personality had already been decided um, by, by what someone else thought of her. So I really hope that you will enjoy Chorus Rises on June 1st. And I hope that, especially if you didn't like Naima in A Song Below Water, I really hope that you will pick it up. Thank you guys so much. Hey, please show some love to Bethany C. Morrow. Oh my God, I'm so excited for more of that world. Like I said, A Song Below Water was incredible and amazing and I just loved it so much. Um, so we got a little bit of time for questions. I don't know if we have a hard out at, at 7 p.m. or if we have a, a, whatever the opposite of a hard out is, like a kind of like a tapering off. But so I see in the chat, Valentina wanted to ask every one of the panelists, what is the best book you've read in the past year? Which I think is a wonderful, uh, kind of icebreaker. Why don't we just go in the same order that we went in before? So Rika, what's the best book you read in the past year? Rika, you're, you're on muted. mute. Uh, so yeah, so On Earth We're Briefly Gorgeous from Ocean Vong is probably, it was a book that uh, really hit me. It, it's a beautiful book, but for me, I felt so, it immediately came out and engulfed me in, in, in its world. And um, it's not science fiction fantasy, but um, there are, there's a truth to it. And there's an element that, that are ironically resonant with a lot of what, you know, a lot of the best uh, science fiction and fantasy. There's just this emotional and this immersive quality. You know, it's real, but it seems almost like somewhere else, like it can't be, but it is. So that's my All right, I have a terrible answer to give. Um, 
but it's twofold. And I've been trying desperately this whole time to think of a better answer. And it's like, stop thinking of a purple elephant. I can't. So my first answer is I can't tell you because it hasn't been announced yet. It's something a friend wrote and it's freaking great. <laughs> and I can't say anything else. The other answer is 2020, as Charlie Jane said, was a terrible year. And I don't know about the rest of you, but I gravitated towards old comfort food so hard last year. I found it really difficult to pick up new stuff. Not that everybody isn't making awesome new stuff, but I found it hard. And uh, I turned to one of my favorite books of all time forever, which is Changing Planes by Ursula Le Guin. It's been one of my comfort reads for probably 15 or more years. It's a book I used to take with me when I would travel just to have it with me. Um, so that's the most best book I read, which is a book I've read 20,000 times. Worst answer ever, but that's the one I've got. Yay, Ron. I didn't read as many books as I'd like to this past year, but one of my favorite authors, and, and I'm gonna mispronounce his name and I apologize in advance, is Christopher Buhlman, Buhlman. Um, and I was fortunate enough to be sent this arc in his latest book, uh, The Black Tongue Thief. And uh, all of his books are very, uh, gritty, um, and I really relate to that. They, they're, they thrust you in a world that feels real, but then there's always this really uh, sinister element to them. But this, in this case, he, he's taken a much uh, uh, satirical approach to traditional fantasy. And uh, uh, without giving too much away, it's just been a delightful read so far. Yay. Um, for me, you know, I'm actually tempted to say that Light from Uncommon Stars and Song Below Water were two of the best books I've read in the past year. Uh, I would say the absolute, like the book that I read recently that I'm still just thinking about all the time is Sorrowland by Rivers Solomon. And quick plug, I'm doing an event with Rivers on Saturday for Lit Quake. Catriona? Sorry. Um Sleep. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, the um, Get in Trouble, the Kelly Link's short story collection, probably would be my my choice. I, I cannot, yeah, exactly. I cannot believe how she makes the otherworldly seem ordinary and vice versa, completely just like that. She she flips the script every time, every, every line, and it's so carefully observed. You just, it, it, it's a better reality than ours, put it that way. <laughs> I would love to live in that one. <laughs> Uh, that I thought Becky was going to say Did we lose? was that I have not really read. Oh, back. Oh no. Did are you are you here, Bethany? I think we've lost oh. Bethany. Ah, oh, I'm like, is it my internet? Is it no, Bethany's it's internet? Mine. It's okay, mine. cool. Am I back? Yes. You're back. Yes. Yay. <laughs> Sorry. Um, this is that's village utilities for you. Um, no, what I thought Becky was gonna say was that she hadn't read anything over the past year, and I was gonna be like, yay, somebody said it. Um, but she didn't. <laughs> she didn't. I have read three books uh since the start of the pandemic because that has been my casualty. That's definitely been the casualty for me is my ability to read. I don't have the bandwidth. I read Luster and I remember it being, I remember it being just that quiet, slow burn intensity that I really love. But I'm currently reading a book called Scorpion, which comes out next week, I think, um, by Christian Cantrell. Um, and I absolutely, I've been reading Christian Cantrell since his containment book, which I think was self-published at first, and just this amazing, stark, dense, very technical science fiction, um, but Scorpion is actually like a thriller, and it's just so sweeping, and, and the, he does these bursts of characterization that I just, that are just amazing, at, right after telling you something so hyper-specific, about technology or something that it's like, I just seeing them together are, it's just so beautiful. I just think he's brilliant. So Scorpion, I think will probably be my favorite of what will have been four books um, that I've read. Cool, well, I mean, you know, it's partly about the quality rather than the quantity and I don't know, 
you know, what, whatever you were able to do to like feel okay during this horrible, horrible, horrible time, which I can't, no good, horrible, absolutely whatever time we all went through. I think that's all the time we have. Thank you so much for coming out today. Thank you for, for coming and joining us. Thank you for all the amazing things you do to help people discover stories. You all are my heroes. Have a great evening and, uh, you know, hope to see you again soon, maybe even in person. Thank you very Thank much, you, everyone. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you. Candy. Thank you, everyone.